uh, example around uh, unused IPs. So a, a big part of uh, ecosystem uh, source of uh, knowledge is of course uh, universities, research organizations, big companies research efforts, um, even the start of weekends, uh, unused ideas and so forth. So there's a lot of uh, unused knowledge and potential uh, innovation material uh, in Europe and also beyond Europe, I would, I would say uh, the number is very similar, more than 90%, more than 90% of existing um, IP created by universities is unused. <clears throat> so that number is crazy. Many of the uh, organization, uh, universities, specifically in um, Europe, uh, are public funded, so basically paid by taxes, citizens pay. So that unused IP, intellectual property, uh, is paid by the citizens, the companies, and then universities try to sell that. Uh, uh, in a function with uh, called techn technology transfer and uh, in most cases they either don't have that function at all or the function is outdated, uh, targeted for that where we started why the innovation is moving for startup ecosystems so it's trying to sell to big companies uh, these findings. So the, the, the model uh, here, the application example is around that to, to look at solving uh, that. Um, and uh, the current models, modules, whether they, the, the, whatever the terms are, uh, this is a typical technology transfer model for university to uh, free uh, or other research organizations to free the <coughs> IPs. So uh, typically there's a big company uh, on the other side with the R&D department and business development function uh, where they negotiate uh, a release of an IP as a custom term and, uh, and then they take that unvalidated business model that is built around that research IP and they try to validate that in the market to make it work to get the return of an investment that they paid for the university uh, and they get the knowledge feedback of whether it's working or how they have to pivot or iterate to get it work or whether they ever get it work. Uh, if they get it work, uh, the, the, typically the big company when they pay, uh, they don't want to have a like a franchise type or not franchise but uh, license type models because if they if they, they have money to pay enough, then if it really flies, they, they get all the benefits as well. But these terms vary. Um, in some level, universities have spin out, so trying to you know, build companies uh, like homegrown companies in the universities, these are usually also very low numbers uh, because it's a combination of uh, uh, there's usually a lot of restrictions how that IP can be used by those uh, spin-outs or the terms are very bad like taking 50% of equity from the from the company and only 50% for the team for something that is totally unvalidated so typically then private investors species cannot invest into those because of the, the poor structure that was created there are exceptions like of course uh, um, something like uh, the most famous universities that are very business oriented, uh, uh, like Stanford or MIT or Michigan, or or there are in Canada like like uh, some universities that don't take any IPs. They every all the IPs are free. But an open IPR model is to look uh, how that same would work on the context of startup and then building an application around that. So here is 
in, uh, instead of that custom negotiation to use similar approach that uh, accelerators came to fix business angel funding uh, model or to bring an, a, a parallel model there where instead of everything was custom negotiated uh, now the model is actually uh, uh, fixed terms and you can then pick and choose to use those uh, with those terms but there is no negotiation at the same time the model is more uh, based on uh, licensing and revenue share models so no upfront payments uh, but rather than take it use it if it works then you pay uh, and making that whole inventory from the you know the dusted back room you know files nobody ever even know it's there making that available just pick and choose uh, in a technical sense and if you use it you can take on these terms you pay with this model if it starts to work and that's it that's a that's a digital economy approach you have the same spin outs that can of course get the same terms or even better if the university so decides uh, startups now can have access to that not only uh, to one typically in this scenario uh, when uh, the in the in the big company buys, they want full rights, that nobody else can use that IP for anything, that they have all the rights. Here, it can be shared rights, so that anyone can take and that can be reused, that same, to multiple companies uh, and multiple tries, or the same way a company can, instead of taking one IP, they can take three or five and merge and come up with an innovation around uh, human behavior research combined with technology research combined with something else. You now that's how innovation uh, works anyway. But the more it's based on solid ground, real research, the, the stronger the, the potential of success as well. Uh, or protectability uh, for that deeper knowledge, maybe hire the, the researcher later. But uh, but also the market is more uh, than uh, competed in the other factors, making it scalable, making the business models work, making it scalable, getting the network effect, being the first to the market and so forth. So now the negotiation is not between a hypothetical value, but the negotiation is between the market, whether the market actually responds to models built based on that IP. And then the, there's a normal market dynamics there. So now if the big company, they have already moved themselves to outsource innovation, meaning that they don't want to do, you know, they understand the disruption is very difficult for them to kill and you know, kill their own business. Uh, so if they see success uh, raising or new potential innovation competing to their market, they try to buy it either successfully or unsuccessfully or they partner with them with the new companies so the models have already worked so this is to bring the model uh, into to the, today also the terms uh, of the licensing of the ip can include a feedback cycle or feedback requirements so that the researchers actually get real market feedback to improve and do better research uh, instead of being blocked by the agreement that they made with the big company who doesn't want to share any of their learnings from the market to avoid competition to emerge. And uh, the validation happens in the, in the markets by one or multiple startups from say IPs. And the further scaling can be either the startup become a big company themselves for the bigger market or the startup gets acquired by a big existing company that has channels to scale that uh, if they are already a company like uh, uh, Google or Apple or Amazon to really scale a digital or non-digital innovation to markets. So a big difference uh, on how to reorganize open IPR model is a, it's a free concept, uh, but this is the types of things where where things can be improved significantly, unlocking more potential from existing ecosystem uh, as part of building that sustainability. But again, 
the universities will not do this by themselves. They would have, would have done this many times over. It is not something it's easy for them. Uh, it requires the types of operators that starts to build them, test them step by step with some limited IP, uh, with some learnings and with an ongoing capability of improving and iterating it. Not with design to fail traditional approach. Okay, let's put it in place. Let's, you know, have funds for two, three years and oh, we didn't achieve results from the market. Because that's typically too short of a time for something like this. The company's R&D department can also be there now more closer to the market, uh, sniffing and exploring the opportunities without needing to do the negotiation or start. And again, these two models can coexist. It's not to jump from one to another, but to start uh, putting some of the IP to a new channel and continuing with the old one. No problem with that. So this can also be aggregated from multiple uh, universities in the city level, in the national level, in the global level, into a pool of IPs uh, that is accessible from multiple different sources with efficient uh, search tools. And the whole thing is based on and, and currently limited by, uh, by the, the IP release models because they're outdated based on the old ones and, uh, and the new ones don't really exist and there are not the ones don't exist who should be looking at improving these types of things. So open release agreement, uh, open use agreement for the IPs released, place to manage open IPRs documents and contact details. So this again for the operators to work. Comparing these models, traditional model, open IPR model. So the long, the old ones, long stable history. The the, the stable world doesn't exist anymore. Uh, the open uh, is new and innovative. Uh, the traditional one is custom flexible. So every agreement can be agreed, pretty much anything. But the negotiation is complex and still uh, the fundamental things of the price and the levels are fixed in the models often. Open IPR models have fixed release and use terms, no negotiations needed. Just click agree on terms and go. Low volume, slow, closed, high volume, fast, open and so forth. So this is just looking at the models uh, from their design perspective. But uh, again, to, to validate this is a separate exercise, but these are sources for the types of things to build new types of values uh, because of the new approaches and the new structural approach to operate. And uh, the measurability aspect as well. So a, a lot of different types of new data and information can be found simply by the putting the system in place. That can be giving information for new researchers to research topics that are more searched or interested or not, depending on if they are economic minded or not. Um, or seeing um, how different things uh, are evolving. So really a lot of different types of data and information that can be put in a system like that. Now we have only covered like few example applications, but when you think about all those different uh, applications, whatever applications you are using yourself in your support function, whatever applications are most used in your own system, and you can think of what type of data and statistics and information can be pulled from that, you can start to see the sources of value to build the ecosystem uh, operations not only sustainability, but also uh, potential, I, I wouldn't say profitability, because the profits most likely will be just spent on accelerating the development uh, and uh, of the own ecosystem and therefore own economy and society for the large as well. 
And the counterpoint here is that you can also understand that all of that available data is actually available to someone else now anyway. The good thing is that most likely LinkedIn is not competing with your ecosystem on the same dimensions or AngelList already is probably competing in, uh, in a certain dimensions uh, locally. So they have that knowledge and most of the ecosystems don't. They only have <clears throat> the knowledge what is catered through user interface or the APIs provided by them, which they control and they limit depending on how they see the value that they want to cater out versus the value they want to keep in and, uh, and so forth. So you could, if you think just Stripe, uh, Stripe knows statistically every subscription service that is using their model, what uh, new startups or new services, how much revenue they are making. Not that they can use that information that way, not that saying that they look at that information that way, just saying what type of data is available if the person or the company wants to share that data. And uh, without identity, with identity for investors or not, um, but, uh, but really the information is not that it doesn't exist, it's that nobody is orchestrating and looking this from the perspective. So uh, I said earlier uh, in other modules also that we know more about any sport in any country about all of the different things that happens within the context of that sport in a data perspective. But the majority of economies have no clue of what's happening really in around their uh, competitiveness in, the, in their economic uh, factor, which is very important for the well-being of, of the societies. So from the, all of those applications, you can think of KPIs like financial transactions and payments, invoicing, cash flows, market revenues, uh, Google Analytics, so all the visitors, conversions of product, uh, uh, where those customers are coming from aggregated view of multiple startups, um, where are most of their markets, product development cycles, iterations, uh, pitching competition, scoring. So a lot of a lot of data to build new value, to extract new value, to mix and match differently, to build new innovation, to build new digital services. Um, and if not who, if not the ecosystem operator, then who? The question is then, then who does this? And uh, the, the point is that uh, the, even the local companies would be building innovations. They most likely are building it as a business, uh, as a normal business, not as something to look at. I'm building this business for my benefit of my economy from the private side. So you can't just expect private side to fix this, or the private side is fixing it in the ways of Amazons and Googles and Facebooks. 